All right, now today we're going to talk about compression. Compression is what makes the world go round for singers who have to sing in big theaters over big orchestras. Um, just about everything we do forms, uh, because of the third uh, law of motion, every action is an equal and opposite reaction. Almost everything and anything we do has a reaction that can sometimes, a lot of times, cause compression. Sometimes it causes it where we'd like to have it, and sometimes it causes it where we should not have it. So, if I breathe deeply, way down behind me, and uh, if I do it correctly, my abdomen will just relax and move inward. Now that means my breath is all, uh, uh, Richard Tucker and uh, Eleanor Stieber call that the diaphragmatic lift. So you pull the abdomen in, and the air fills up the body, and the chest rises slightly. It's exactly what Caruso describes in his book about how to breathe. And then, when I start to sing, I go, ah, and guess what? I made a compression against my chest. So when they asked Mattia Battistini how he sang, he said, I press my chest. <laughs> in other words, these people are all have something in common. They're just the greatest singers in the history of the world. Uh, 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 Tetrasini said, fill up the, 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 the back, start with the lowest corner of your lungs and start breathing there and then fill the lungs from the bottom to the top and then lean the breath over against your chest, uh, against your sternum, she said, I think, uh, the way you'd lean a ladder against the wall. Look at that. Now, what if I do that? Huh. Another form of compression. And you realize that compression and the management of compression, keeping it consistent in the location and in the degree of pressure you use, uh, becomes a great vocal style if we keep doing this after a while. So I'm going to breathe behind me, and then I'm going to lean my breath over. There it is. Now, am I keeping my compression the same? I'm trying. So that's when the whole invention of the idea of downbowing came in. Some concept that helps the singer maintain an absolute even degree of pressure and compression while they're singing. Uh, I love Leonard Warren's voice, had a magnificent voice, and his idea of management of the uh, of the compression was to create what he called the, 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 the ice skating pond. And he said from, from his chest down to his uh, navel that everything was absolutely frozen, stiff. So if I freeze, how do I sing if that doesn't move? And that means when I breathe in also. So when I breathe in, the fact that this doesn't move means I have to breathe someplace else. There are three places to breathe, chest, belly, and back. So if I hold my chest still, I can't use that. And if I pull my belly in when I breathe, I can't use that, so which means I have to breathe in my back. Now all I have to do now is just start singing and the compression will be automatic. <laughs> because it has no choice, see? So someone like Zinka Milanov sang that way, UC Berlin sang that way. There were a lot of the great singers that sang that way where they would hold everything completely still, but big breathing behind them. And uh, when you stand behind some of the singers, you see their rib cages going like that. And you stand in front of them, you can see anything move. So there was a lot of activity behind them. And uh, uh, my old teacher used to say, I wanted you to breathe very much behind you, behind you. And behind, she'd say, she didn't learn English until she was uh, 60 years old. And she would say phrases like, your future lies behind you. <laughs> so anyway, if I breathe the way these singers talk about breathing, really, There we go. Now, Lily Lehman said to do a breath, uh, to do a Valsalva maneuver. <laughs> now the breath has stopped. I start an exhalation and then I stop it by closing my vocal cords and I get a big reaction in my chest when I do that. After a while, you forget the vocal cords, so you go straight to the chest and go, <laughs> and the breath stops here. 
So I breathe. Now, Tito's keep and Claudia Muzio said they sighed. So what kind of breath stop do I have a sigh? So I'm going to breathe. They both said they sighed right here behind the sternum. So I'm going to go, ah, ah, Is there a breath stop there while I'm singing? Because when I stop, something goes, ah. So I must have had a breath stop the whole time. And that breath stop becomes a form of compression, although it's very mild, very mild. I'm not compressing hard at all. A hard one would be, Hello, where I set up a real breath stop. I go three L's, and I go against my sternum, and I go, Hello, hello. If I'm sighing, I only use gravity. I go, ah, and I sigh against my sternum, and I get, ah, how are you? Now, the thing about sighing, there have been three that I know of, three sighing methods that worked. All of them incorporate a kind of compression. That one certainly is a lean of the breath against the diaphragm. It's just I'm not presetting or fixing it or doing anything like that. All I'm doing is going, ah, oh, like you lean a ladder against the wall, except the ladder is more like a big feather. Now, what if I sigh from my navel down? In other words, I'm still sighing, leaning my breath, the weight of a feather, against my a navel and downward into my abdomen and it really is not a heavy push thigh, uh, pressure at all it's just a natural compression of the weight of air itself oh, it feels like I'm just going oh, which I'm doing <laughs> right now the third one is one where you sigh back and down uh, the, the, your, your spine or back and down your, your trachea and you try to take it all the way to your tailbone if you can and you go Oh. La, 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 la. Now, that's the way Gigli, Benimeno Gigli, and Giacomo Lauri Volpi said that they were taught to sing. They were taught to sing by sighing backwards and down. They called it sliding back and down. So we have three sides here. We have the one where I... Oh lean the breath or drop the breath on, on my sternum then I have the one where I drop it from my navel down if you sing in all some of the operas I sang, when I sang Master Singing for Nuremberg or uh, Queen of Spades by Tchaikovsky, uh, some of these really super long pieces, I sighed the whole thing. I said, I'm not going to get exhausted and, and, and poop out and lose my voice before this thing is over because my singer is five and a half hours. Uh, Don Carlo was another one. That's four and a half hours. And uh, uh, Queen of Spades is a good four to four and a half hours. So the idea is you're, it's like a marathon. How are you going to survive, uh, survive the best? You watch the Olympics, the runners, they don't dash and run as fast as they can if it's, if it's one of those long, long races. They do that in a short race, but they don't do it in the long races. And you watch the marathon runners, they do 26 miles, and uh, they sort of look like they're sort of jogging the whole time. They're not running fast. At the end, they try to put a spurt on of uh, energy to try to catch up with somebody or try to win right at the end. And most of them do that if they have any energy left. And then they fall down afterwards when they cross the finish line. But the idea is we're trying to be economical, especially when there's a, a possibility that you'll get tired in the performance. Some of the operas are so short and so intense 
that you don't really need to worry about it. If I do something like uh, Cavalleria, Cavalleria is very intense and very short. If I sigh it, I get, let's say I sigh here, in other words, I can sigh and still sing some of this more intense music. So some singers, once they discover how to sigh and sing, won't do anything else. <laughs> they love it so much because it is really, it doesn't cost you a thing to do that. It's like gravity is doing the work for you. Uh, even when you breathe in, if you're going to sigh, you go... And the way you breathe in is not even that active. There are some methods where you breathe in like mad. The one I learned from Richard Tucker, the so-called diaphragmatic lift, uh, he taught it to me by making me snore. So I'd have people snore sometimes. It depends on what kind of repertoire they're going to end up singing. But if you snore, you go... Anyway, this one creates a pre-lean. I have pressure here now without, without doing anything. I, I have now, the, the result of all that breathing is that the compression is already established. I have compression against my chest. So when they asked Matti Battistini, he's considered the greatest baritone that ever lived, he said, I press my chest. He didn't, know, didn't need to do anything else. See? So if I breathe like that, it's already here. I start singing. If it's not there, then you hear singers doing all kinds of little things to get it going. Like Benny Minogia used to sob. He would, he would, he would uh, uh, sigh back and down. And then he'd go, ah, 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 and that little sob would sort of create enough compression for him to sing. It's a pity to have to sob like that all the time, but he had a magnificent voice, one of the greatest ever, and nobody cared. <laughs> the only ones that cared were his colleagues who got a little tired of hearing it all the time, right? So it's funny that he and Laude Volpe studied with the same teacher, and uh, Laude Volpe didn't sob. He was more of a, a, a true technical <laughs> singer, right? Now, so we're going to talk about compression as we go along here. We're going to find out exactly which way, of, which kind of compression do you need and I need uh, to get your voice, every, every pair of uh, vocal, vocal cords, or vocal folds, has a certain amount of resistance to them. The big, thick ones, the big, heavy, dramatic voices, they're very thick, there's a lot of resistance in them. Very high color to the sopranos have very little resistance. So they don't need as much compression, and someone else might need a, a lot of it to get the voice going. But there are certain uh, exercises we can do that are, that are uh, I call them instigators, because they start the compression process. Ba, 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 ba. If I say, ma, 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 it doesn't create any compression. But if I go, ba, and I stop that B, it creates compression. So if I breathe behind me and go, ba, 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 la, ba, 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 so I can actually sing with the compression that, I, that was created by vocalizing or using the B consonant, because the B stop, closes my nose, and when I go, my breath is lean, stopped, compressed, right here. So what is some of these uh, some of these vocalises? Are, I, I learned all of these from great singers. I didn't make any of them up, by the way. <clears throat> Another one. Well, we we did the sob, which is the uh, we call that the falsetto attachment. That is not a compressed sound. It's a falsetto. If I attach it to my diaphragm, and now it's compressed and sitting on my diaphragm. See? So if we do these, and we really do a lot of them, uh, we have things like a miniature cough. That was Manuel Garcia's whole school of singing. And I had two, two teachers that were Garcia people that studied with students of Garcia. 
and uh, he used a miniature golf. So you go, <coughs> well, look at the compression I'm creating. <coughs> Feel that? So if I keep a cough <coughs> all the time, hopefully not audible, but <coughs> see, I'm coughing, but I'm going to hide it and not let anybody hear it. See? You can really get going with some of these uh, compression uh, exercises. They let you sing much bigger and much more intensely. Uh, one of the ones that I learned that I don't like very much, and I was always afraid to use it very much in lyric voices, was the wheeze. You go, ah, <laughs> ah. a very exaggerated uh, form of compression. So, but I can use it to sing with. But it makes it very intense and puts a lot of in the voice. Not very pretty. Uh, another one that resembles that one is to let air uh, out while you're exhaling. In other words, exhale part of the air and then start singing. Somebody go, you can hear it, you can recognize the lack of color somewhat in that in a sort of ah, intense way of singing. So some uh, pianist or coach you're working with tells you, don't breathe, don't breathe, no, don't breathe. What you're left with is only the ability to squeeze the air to get it out. So if you do that, you'll be using a spin-toe technique. That's what a spin-toe technique is. People compare it to the turkey baster, where the bulb is already in that shape, and to get the air to come out of that bulb, I have to squeeze the gravy. I have to squeeze it. So if I go, ah, here's the sound. Uh, if I breathe real, real big before I do that, I go and do a falsetto attachment. See, it's a, a different way of using compression. One is, and the other is, look, folks, uh, I've learned every one of these from great singers, so everyone I'm getting, throwing at you here uh, works. There's no doubt about it. It should be, however, for the right voice. I've never heard uh, any of the light lyric voices or even full lyric voices use the wheeze method. But I've heard the wheeze method used by dramatic singers and uh, a few spintos, right? Uh, the wheeze method that I learned was mainly from Giovanni Martinelli, who took Caruso's place at the Metropolitan Opera, and they called uh, uh, Martinelli the hammer because his voice was so enormous in the theater. But nobody ever said it was pretty. <laughs> but his technique was to not breathe at all, just stand there and then go, ah! which means he didn't breathe, so there's no excess air. There's only the air in his natural shape, his natural body shape. Here I am. Bang, I'm dead. Now, what shape is my rib cage? How much air do I have? Because I've got to squeeze that to sing with if I use a spinto method. Sometimes people run out, you know. I mean, they run out of air. They're not big enough, see. I'm not going to breathe. You get the idea. Uh, they say the Corella, that Corella, that Martinelli, I, I heard him sing, but he was old when I heard him sing in 77. Um, but they say when he was young, that he would turn crimson. His face, his head would look like a tomato. It was completely red. And then the red, he used to wear these very handsome. He used to wear these, these costumes that were open down like that. Uh, and you could see the red line <laughs> singing down his chest. But he sang like, um, and, and had a long, I heard, I said 77. I was 21, he was 77. He was still singing, right? So it didn't ever hurt his voice at all. Now, another one would be the, the let's say, the, the Miller Maneuver. <gasps> Where's my compression now being created? Think about it. You feel that way down there in your lower back when you do that? 
and now I'm going to sing back there. I'm going to sing with that compression. Now, if I did that, you'd say, oh, you're a Heldon tenor, a young Heldon tenor. Hmm. I don't think so, folks. I think I'm just using something that made it sound a little bit bigger that day. Uh, really, the, the, the point of this is to try to make singers that don't know it, so a lot of you know it already, um, but those that don't know it, how, to make you aware of this compression that is necessary all the time. Um, some singers just laugh, like someone like uh, Jan Kipura was a laugher. He just laughed all the time. Why do I need more compression than that? See? In other words, the minute I laugh, I've got compression. And the compression allows me to sing over a big orchestra and a big theater without any problem at all. The whole question of what what you should lift and what you should move and what's the relative function and the retinoid to cry or the cry all that has nothing to do with real singing. Real singing is breathe a certain way and sing with the result. Because uh, we can't really think about this and that and all those things when you're out there singing and you're singing some big monster part. It's hours long. Basically, you're thinking about survival. Uh, Don Carlos got 49 B flats and 9 B naturals and about 500 A naturals and a thousand G sharps. <laughs> and the first, the first note of the opera is is in the passaggio. Il verduta, il verduta. Right. So, and then it sort of goes up from there <laughs> for the next four and a half hours. I've sung it in French and Italian both, and uh, one wasn't easier than the other. <laughs> tell you, it was it was a real squeeze fest. And, uh, you know, you can get it, you can sing it. I didn't have any trouble singing I've got tapes of the performances, but uh, I've I, I worked a lot. I did a lot of squeezing. <laughs> and uh, uh, usually I'd have to take a day off after I sang that one because it was just, it just, like, use you up. Man, you just, you're, you're squeezing like... And then the last scene of that opera is all mezzo voce in the passaggio. So you're, you have to do, as Caruso said, your mezzo voce requires a double breath support. <laughs> like, I've got double left. Are you kidding? How about, how about one-tenth? Anyway, uh, so there, there are a whole list of these compression exercises. The, uh, you do that long snoring exercise, right, and it presets everything. It create, you end up, uh, if you do that for long numbers, uh, as a just practice, after a while you identify this kind of pr uh, pre, uh, it, uh, how shall I say, the, the, the breathing itself, because I call it cramming a suitcase. It's like I've got my suitcase full and I got a couple more pair of pants and things to jam in there and I'm jamming them in and then I have to sit on it to, to pack it down. That's the way this feels if you do the really big uh, uh, diaphragmatic lift exercises. And that's why Richard Tucker sounded the way he did and, and you had to remember something about Richard Tucker. He sang anything. He sang, the, the, he sang light Mozart parts and then turned right around and sang the heaviest Verdi parts, big parts. I mean, uh, it, 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 was, it was really interesting. So could Caruso, by the way. Caruso, in the last week, he sang the Metropolitan Opera, sang Samson, dramatic tenor, Lazio d'Amore, coloratura tenorino, and then La Juive, which is a Heldon tenor. And if you sing Carmen, you're the tenor, you sing the first act, Lyric, second act, Lyric, Spinto, third act, Heldon tenor, and the fourth act, Spinto, right? Uh, the parts are not always written ideally for your voice. So it's good to know different compression methods, <laughs> different, different ways to compress the breath, and if you can get them, believe me, they will save your bacon many, many times, right? Uh, you think about uh, sometimes you need to make, let's say, a, a fatter sound, right? So I go... So he lights and sees the heat. A lot of middle voice singing, a lot of uh, uh, orchestra. And you don't want to have to squeeze and pump the, and compress your way through that. So you breathe in a way that creates compression for you. So what I did, I breathed in and right in the middle of this exhalation, I started singing. 
That puts my compression way down here and sort of outward, right? And it makes my voice darker, fatter, and it still carries. So some people don't like the sound. Some people actually prefer the sound. So, you know, that's neither here nor there. Uh, and then there are other ways to do it. If I do something like this, I, I like this exercise, and I've, I did even videotapes on it, calling it uh, Align the Spine, I think. But if I do this one, and I pull, uh, let's say I'm up here high on my head, and I pull straight back, it creates, you know, where is the compression? Where does that cause compression? It's limiting me to singing a certain way, and I'm going to have to use compression if I do that. Where, though? Oh, you today I'm feeling fine. See that? What does that make me compress? Or oh, where is compression? Where does it come from and where does it go? Right? If I move this, this method, if I change it and move it way down here where my neck connects to my spine, I've done some of this with the align the spine, but we're, th we're thinking of it today in terms of the compression it causes. So I'm going to lean back like man and pull my hands forward. Now you tell me, uh, let's see, yeah, I'm still in the right key. Uh, what does it do? What does this compression do and where is it? In other words, these, uh, these compression methods can literally change your voice. Sometimes you can make it very, very efficient, but you have to be careful. Don't use the wrong compression music in the music. I, I would never, I never want this to go. Sounds ridiculous. So the idea is that you, you find the compression that matches what you're going to sing as much as possible. I mean, I'm 83 years old. I'm not sure I got a lot of choices left, especially trying to make it light. Um, it's easier for me just to go boo and let it and let it go. But if you do that, think about it. If I do that huge uh, breath through the through with the with the resistance up here, that's why you, that's when you snore, you create resistance in the salt pellet up inside here, and you go. That's different from that one causes me to foot fill up, and the, the 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 pressure goes like that, and my my compression is coming against my lower flanks down here. It's a nice, sizable, fat tone, right? If I do the snore bit, just in other words, if I do this one, now where's the compression? See, it moved up here. If you realize you don't have a choice of sounds, or was that the right word? Maybe quality of sounds is a better word. And uh, anyway, think about this, and uh, I, I've, I can, maybe I'll, I'll do a number two so I can go, go through all of these various compression methods. Sure. Yeah, we have, uh, we have uh, um, uh, what's the one? Pre-sneeze, for instance. Now, where's the compression? No! <laughs> Where is the compression? See? Breath of fire. <laughs> they all change my voice because the compression is changing uh, places, points of leaning, they used to call it in Italian. I did a tape the other day called uh, um, Il Ponte da Poggio. That's the point of leaning. And it's, uh, it's where the breath establishes its connection to the diaphragm. All right? Think about all that. And I hope it gives you some ideas. You, you notice, as Richard Tucker said to me, see, the voice does nothing. The breath does everything. This is a good example. You use compression enough, you'll find you, the voice is always there waiting for you to give it a little fuel. And depending how you give it fuel, it's going to run like a bomb or run like a comfortable uh, sedan <laughs> or maybe like a Yugo. So uh, good luck. Bye.